It is the Pastor's Heart and Dominic Steele and a Freedom for Faith update on the sea changes in euthanasia, equality, conversion therapy and religious freedom. Monica Dumit and Mike Southen are our guests. The next six months are going to be bumpy for religious freedom issues here in New South Wales, Australia. There's a rollout of euthanasia in our state starting in just a few weeks time on the 28th of November and then the proposed ban on conversion and suppression and independent Alex Greenwich's Omnibus Equality Bill, plus a finalisation of the Australian Law Reform Commission inquiry into religious schooling and particularly whether or not religious exemptions to anti-discrimination law should be removed or not. Monica Dumit is Director of Public Affairs and Engagement for the Catholic Church in Sydney and was one of the presenters at the Freedom for Faith conference today here in Sydney and Mike Southam is Executive Director of Freedom for Faith. Monica, perhaps we can start with you and you could just kind of give us an introduction to this sea change that is well happened over the last five years and continuing to happen and uh, yeah, what's going on? <laughs> well, if we look back to the uh, to December 2017 where we had the introduction of same-sex marriage, I think all of us thought that that was a, a big watershed moment uh, in terms of social change here in Australia. But what we've seen in the five to six years since that transpired is a number of different laws uh, changing uh, all on critical social issues, whether that's abortion, euthanasia, uh, pre pre uh, prohibition uh, on so-called conversion practices in some states, uh, limitations of religious freedom. It seems to have happened all in the last five or six years. And so there's certainly been a wave um, of legislation that's challenging for churches and for mm -hmm. Christian ministries. Uh, and if we're looking at New South Wales, as you mentioned, we have the implementation of euthanasia beginning later this month. We will have the introduction of the government's uh, proposed ban on conversion practices. We'll, we've already got the legislation tabled by the independent member for Sydney, Alex Greenwich, uh, that seeks to amend a whole range of laws uh, in the name of equality and at a federal level, the Australian Law Reform Commission mm. looking in. So there are a lot of things happening in the next six months. Mm. Uh, it's a very critical time. Mm. You were acknowledging today that um, one of the things that have been going on is the loss of moral authority of the churches uh, in the community and particularly the Catholic Church there. Well, I guess, yeah, what I was saying is that the end of uh, 2017 saw the finalisation of the Royal Commission into institutional responses into child sexual abuse. And for those who remember that time, it revealed obviously a lot of shocking and, um, and terrible details of sort of crimes and cover-ups within institutions. And uh, I think something like, uh, out of the complaints, 60% of those related to religious institutions and of that 60%, 60% related to the Catholic Church. And so I think when a lot of these social issues were coming up before parliaments, uh, there was a often a loud suggestion that churches should be quiet because mm. if they didn't have their own house in order, how, how dare they be speaking about moral issues anywhere else? And mm. so I do think that that uh, contributed to, I guess, the muting or um, the silencing and, and sometimes self-censorship of some in church leadership uh, in relation to some of these social issues. Yeah. Mm. Mike, um, let's talk euthanasia first. Um, it's going to be messy when it starts here in New South Wales later this month. Yes. It's, um, How messy? What's, what, when we say messy, what do we mean? Yeah. Uh, well, there's, going to be, there's a lot of questions uh, about how it's going to be implemented. I haven't seen full <coughs> guidelines around implementation. One of the real messy bits is going to be in um, how we can um, choose not to be involved. Doctors should be able to conscientiously object and not be involved in euthanasia. But uh, there, there's a lot of power dynamics, there's a lot of complexity in whether or not at the time uh, they're going to be able to say, I don't want to be part of this, if say their boss is saying that they need to be part of this. Uh, we've got a lot of complexity or concerns for institutions themselves, like a, a retirement village. So a Christian retirement village like um, Anglicare, who doesn't want to have and people- And let's face it, many of the um, 
providers of aged care services are provided uh, by the faith care sector. By the fa yes, absolutely. And most of them come from Christian traditions who hold that life is sacred and we should not be actively taking life. And they don't want that happening on their property. These institutions started as expressions of faith to care for people who were needed. Um, they're not just um, service providers to do whatever the person wants. And they wanted to be able to uh, implement their faith and hold to their faith on their property. So at the moment, there is no uh, uh, space for conscientious objection for those institutions to say, actually, we don't want this on our property. So a Christian retirement village likely is going to have to be storing drugs of death on their property in preparation for somebody who is going to voluntarily die and the institution can't say that that doesn't fit with what we believe. Mm. How are you in the Roman Catholic um, space navigating this, uh, Monica? Yeah, well, look, what we're trying to do is hopefully get a, a united approach um, because you have a whole number of different aged care providers. Some are quite large and, and uh, are open to and cater for people of you know many faith backgrounds. Uh, and some are also almost community based where it's sort of a maybe a certain migrant community have their own little small aged care mm. facility. Uh, and so there are very different. Mm. Um, I mean, just down the road here for years, there's a Greek Orthodox um, uh, aged care facility and um, caring primarily for people of Greek or Greek Orthodox background. Yeah, yeah exactly right. And, and so the question for me becomes, should those people of the Greek Orthodox community be able to live out their, their final days in a place where they can be certain that there aren't going to be pe there aren't going to be lethal drugs on site. Mm -hmm. So often this is pitched as sort of the institutional right against the individual pa patient or resident, mm -hmm. but actually it's about whether or not a group of residents can come together and say we want to live in a place where this isn't going to happen, or for families to say we want to entrust our parents. Um, or our other loved ones to a place where confident we... that there's not going to be institutional pressure to go in that direction. Absolutely, yeah. and the only way that you can do that is if an institution has complete rights to opt out, and not this sort of halfway house that the legislation puts us in, which says, well, you can opt out as an institution, but you have to allow other people to come on site uh, in order to consult on euthanasia, to make assessments, to. Uh, deliver and administer lethal drugs. So what's going to happen 28th of November when it all, the doors open, when the legislation says go and yeah? Well look, I imagine that we'll see um, in the faith-based institutions uh, what's happened I think in other states which is that it's not, um, it's not taken up by a lot of the residents because they're going in there with a particular perspective and also I find what the faith based facilities have been quite successful doing in other places is when a, when a resident starts speaking about euthanasia or assisted suicide, they're able to bring in all of those other supports and say, okay, well, what are you actually asking for? Are you, actually, are you asking for euthanasia or, or assisted suicide or are you expressing some type of fear, some type of pain that's not actually being managed well? And is there, are there other things that we can do to assist you in that and, and to give you good, holistic end of life care, mm. give you real dignity in death, not the fake dignity in death that's being, uh, that's being sold by other um, activists. The one thing I will say though, Dominic, is that it's actually not clear how this will play out because Victoria has had euthanasia and assisted suicide for a number of years, as has WA. Um, but neither of those jurisdictions require faith-based facilities to allow this on site, nor does Tasmania. So New South Wales is actually... That's New South Wales is worse, tougher, more anti-Christian than Victoria <laughs> or... Um, New... How did that happen? It's, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Um, so I actually don't know how it happened. And if I'm being honest, in some of the private conversations I've had with members of parliament, they didn't even realise that the aged care facilities didn't have these Exemptions. didn't have these protections in place. Yeah, and so they said, "Oh no, no, you got your you got your protections." I was like, "No, we no, didn't. didn't. The amendment was voted down." But that's what happens when when legislation like this is getting pushed through, and and MPs are there to all hours of the evening mm -hmm. uh, on successive days. 
I think, unfortunately, there is a little bit of a tendency of we just want to get this over Roll with. We know over, it's going to reject pass. Reject all the amendments. Yeah. Reject all the amendments. And um, I think what my Archbishop described it as is a winner takes all approach. So mm -hmm. once you realise that you have the number to that you have the numbers in Parliament to pass the legislation, there doesn't seem to be any willingness to be open to amendments or protections or things like that. It's just a bit of a uh, a winner takes all, all mm. approach, yeah. Now, junior doctors are also put in a particularly difficult position here. Yes. Mike? Yeah, and it, there is, in any kind of work, there's power dynamics, but uh, a junior doctor has to do, you know, is constantly doing the sorts of tasks that the senior doctors are telling him to do. Uh, senior doctors have got their career in their hands in many ways. They control their promotion paths, their um, future training, specialisation, things like that. So There's don't a lot rock of the influence, boat. So yeah. don't rock the boat. And so a junior doctor can say, I'm a conscientious objector, and that's fine, and that's fine, until the day that the, a senior doctor says, who's under stress, knows he has to go do something, doesn't have time to do it, grabs a junior doctor and says, you, go and that mm -hmm. room and do it and that's that's the moment of crisis what do you do mm. okay next one conversion practice legislation yes. and um, uh, there was a significant pre-election promise from the Minns government at the various freedom for faith uh, forums across the state yes um, give us the picture of what the pre-election promise was let's start with you Michael yeah, yeah so um, the churches around New South Wales uh, 35 different electorates, they had a candidate forum, uh, and in most of those candidate forums there was a Labor candidate, and most of those candidate forums they asked the question, if you were going to implement a conversion therapy, will you protect religious freedoms? Will you use the Victorian model? And we knew that Alex Greenwich was bringing up his um, legislation. We we're asking, will you use Greenwich's model or are you going to do something else? And so the Labor candidates were actually all given a script by head office to answer, and they committed that they would not use Alex Greenwich's model. They would not use the Victorian model. They would not ban prayer. They would not ban preaching. And most helpfully, they would not ban consensual requests for help. Mm -hmm. So that was what was built into the script that most candidates uh, stuck to one way or another. Chris Mintz himself attended a event in Parramatta and he attended his own candidates forum in Cogra. And he made the same sorts of commitments that we would let you make your choice and go and ask for help if that's what you want. So where are we now, Monica, in the negotiation? Negotiations with the government on this. So uh, a few months ago, the, the government ran a private consultation. So they didn't put out a consultation paper for public um, for public review. They gave it to a handful of, I guess, interested parties, including the faith communities. I would say, including also the LGBT community and others. Mm -hmm. um, and that consultation paper outlined a number of questions and a number of proposals to which we were invited to respond. Uh, from what I understand, in the preparation of that consultation paper, uh, they weren't given or didn't have access to the promises, the pre-election promises that Mike just referred to. That's what they said. Which does sound astonishing to me. It, yeah. it, it does. Um, I mean, it beggars belief, really. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In that meeting, they said we went online to find what promises we were going to be, um, and they found Chris Minns's promises, but they didn't find the the fuller. Um, promises that a lot of the um, candidates were making, but they it, they didn't seem to be thoroughly briefed to be these are all the promises that Labor has made. So, at the moment, they've gone back to the drawing board, having been reminded that this was the promise they took to the election. Is that what's happened, or? We don't know what they've gone back to. Uh, so we've had a lot of meetings, a lot of productive meetings with uh, MPs, ministers, the Attorney General, Premier, explaining what our concerns are, what we're looking for in a balanced legislation. We, we want to prevent against coercive harm, but we want to protect religious freedom. We've had all these conversations. We've been heard. They've definitely, they definitely have heard us, but we don't know what's happening. We haven't seen any legislation. Uh, we've heard a, a statement in the media that legislation is coming in November. Well, it is November and we haven't seen a draft. We haven't had any consultation. So we genuinely just don't know mm. what's going on. Mm. Monica? Yeah. My hope is that in good faith, uh, they will revisit the proposals in that consultation paper and come closer to the pre-election commitments mm -hmm. uh, that were made. I think that 
um, if I'm if I'm being frank, I think that I've been quite impressed by the sincerity with which the government has approached this issue, and sort of their their promises of um, of being faithful to those pre-election commitments. And so I'm hopeful that the legislation, the draft legislation that comes out uh, later this month, will reflect uh, will reflect those promises. Mm. Now, suppression seems to be the, um, mm. the the word that is causing most angst in the uh, in, amongst my Christian friends. Do you mm. want to talk about that? Sure. Well, when we talk about conversion practices, that's really changing from one to the other. And so what you, I guess, what is sold in the media or described in the media is ch- trying to change somebody's sexual orientation from homosexual to heterosexual. Uh, and we know in the past that that's been linked to some quite abhorrent practices mm. that are against the dignity of the human person. Um, but when we talk about suppression, there is the, um, the likelihood that that will actually be seen as really anything that asks for sexual restraint. So anything that says, no, you shouldn't act on those sexual desires that you might have Mm. or those sexual attractions that you might have could count as suppression. And this isn't even an issue about homosexuality. This applies just equally to heterosexuality as well. So uh, you're a So I'm just thinking about the the 1 Corinthians, flee from sexual immorality. Do you know, there's a a verse in the Bible. That's sexual suppression. So preaching 1 Corinthians 6, just that's going to get us in trouble? It's, it's quite, well, it's interesting because the, at least the consultation paper and, and some of the language from the government says you're allowed to preach it, but you're just not allowed to tell somebody that they, can apply, that they have to apply it to their lives. So you can preach it generally, but you can't tell somebody then that, that should influence the way that they behave. So, so, so your preaching becomes an academic exercise. So in most churches, there's education in preaching, there's education in small group discussion, mm-hmm. and there's education in one-on-one um, uh, Bible reading, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and prayer. Yeah, yeah. so the, the one-on-one would definitely be out, and potentially the, the small group as well. So I'll give you just a very benign example. Say you have a married heterosexual man come to you and say, look, um, I've met another woman. I'm really attracted to her. I'm tempted to, to uh, cheat on my wife and... and uh, as, as the pastor, I say, resist temptation. Yeah. That could be seen as suppression uh, and, and expose you not only to criminal, but also civil liability, uh, which is which is pretty, a very strange idea. Mm. Um, I mean, that's, that feels like unintended concept. I mean, it seems just bizarre that that would be put forward, yeah. I don't think it's unintended. Mm. This was brought up in yep. the debates around the Victorian legislation as well. Uh, and they, they went ahead knowing full well that this is how the legislation would be interpreted. Um, and, and more than that, they specifically said that's how they want. So. Besides, in case you feel like we're catastrophizing what this <laughs> legislation is, this is the legislation that's in Victoria. And the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, VROC, have got a website which says what you can and cannot do, what would be a, cha- a conversion suppression practice, and what wouldn't. And they specifically say that encouraging somebody to live in chastity, because otherwise, apart from having sex within marriage, is a suppression practice and would be unlawful. Specifically said on their publicly accessible website, they give examples of the sorts of prayers that are acceptable. So a prayer that is acceptable is it's acceptable to pray with someone and thank God that they are perfect as they are and accepted by God as they are. It is not acceptable to pray a prayer that indicates in any way that they could be broken need repentance conver- or, or changing the way that they live. So it's... It, so, so this right. legislation it's, is going to run foul of, well, the Catholic Church, yep. the Anglican Church, the Presbyterian... Keep going. The, Help the, fill the, the list out for me. It, Muslims. Muslims, Hindus, uh, the Jewish communities as well. This isn't only an, an issue for Christians. Uh, and when it comes to Catholics, I, I was saying in the presentation, and I'll repeat it here, this could also affect... Um, the Catholic Church saying to their priests, you need to be celibate um, because that would also be technically mm. a suppression practice. Mm. So, I mean, that's a big thing. <laughs> it, it's a big thing, but, but I would say what Mike was saying um, is probably 
even bigger because this is the state dictating what you can pray. Mm-hmm. Is there any greater example of overreach or impingement on religious freedom than telling you wh- what you can and cannot pray, who you cannot can and cannot pray for? Um, it's just, it, it is extraordinary. Yeah. And the, the VROC website goes on, it talks about um, preaching. So there is an exemption uh, in the Victorian legislation that you can preach what you believe unless it's directed towards an individual. Mm. And the VROC website says, if you are aware of somebody in your congregation who is, suffer- is struggling with same-sex attraction, your sermon could be considered to be directed at that individual. So even just the fact that you're up in the pulpit saying the Bible calls you to live this way sexually, that actually could well be a suppression practice if you knew there was someone in your congregation struggling with that issue. And that's, again, public website. That's what they've said. That this is the ruling. And I think what it is, I think there's a great misunderstanding of what religion and what faith is supposed to do. It mm. calls all of us to conversion. Mm. I mean, that's, that's the message. Repent and mm. <laughs> believe in the gospel. Like that, That's what we're called to. And so this idea that conversion is somehow some awful practice that goes on. No, we're all called to conversion. We're all called to conversion daily Mm. um, to conform our lives closer to Christ. And so this idea that somehow this is some barbaric practice, it's just, it speaks really to an ignorance of religion and the importance of religion in people's lives, I think, Mm. by those uh, suggesting these laws. And again, not unintended consequences, because we've had one uh, MP who's pushing this very hard, an activist, and has said um, publicly that he wants to not only ban conversion practices, but the beliefs that underlie them. So this is an intentional attempt to silence people who disagree with a specific worldview on sexuality. What about the issues of gender identity, Michael? And gender identity gets even more complicated because it's it is an even a, it's a medically contested space uh, as well as being a theologically contested one. But in the current proposal that we saw from the Department of Communities and Justice, uh, it does not separate between gender identity and sexuality in the legislation. It says it is illegal to embark in this sort of conversion or suppression practice on the basis of sexuality or gender identity. So everything we've said applies with somebody who comes up with you, including a minor, who comes and talks to you and says, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm the gender that I'm born at with. Uh, any attempt to say, even wait, wait and see what's going to happen and the face of the proposal that's come Mm. would be a suppression practice because the best thing to do for a child who says that they are a different gender is to immediately treat them and immediately give them the puberty blockers and uh, and all the treatment that they need so anything that says wait is a suppression practice we have had um, and yet so many kids actually go through phases and absolutely this another group who are really upset about this actually are the lgb groups so gay and lesbian groups who are saying a, the, a, a girl who goes through gender confusion will gr- often grow up to be a very happy healthy gay lesbian girl and so they are very concerned about um, pushing kids in very confused situations through a gender transformation uh, but when we're talking about like the, the conversion and suppression legislation of what it's saying is it is restricting our ability to even talk about all these realities. Uh, we have had an example of a family member in Victoria uh, who wrote to their other family member uh, who was planning to go through gender transformation uh, and, and wrote, I don't think you should do this, I don't think it's a good idea. And the Victorian Equal Opportunity Human Rights Commission wrote to that family member saying, what you did was a suppression practice and likely to be unlawful. So we're already having examples of, in another state, commissions clamping down on people, on just family members saying, maybe you should wait, Mm. don't do this. Mm. A concerned grandparent, uncle, parent, Mm. can't have those conversations. Oh, sorry, Monica. I was just gonna say, and one of the, the important things is that in a number of jurisdictions overseas, we're seeing the opposite happen. So in the UK, in Sweden, in Norway, in other places, they're saying, we're actually going to outlaw giving children puberty blockers because we consider them to be experimental. We don't know the long-term effects of them. And so 
on the one hand, we've got jurisdictions that are prohibiting uh, pushing children down a gender affirmative path. And here we're about to do the opposite, which is say, well, you ha we're going to outlaw anything except a gender affirmative path. Which is extraordinary when um, if you've got, we're going to outlaw doing anything except this, and yet one of the Australian medical defence insurance companies is pulling back from insuring doctors to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So MDA National announced that as of the 1st of July of this year, they were going to not um, provide insurance cover coverage to private practitioners who prescribed um, cross-sex hormones to kids under 18. I think maybe even puberty blockers as well. I'd have to double check. But they think, and they said it's not an ideological, um, it's not an ide ideological issue. It's actually a financial one. We the risk to the children is unquantifiable at this stage. And so simply from a financial point of view, we don't, we can't quantify the risk we're undertaking by backing doctors who are prescribing these. Mm -hmm. So if you have the insurers saying this, if you have uh, jurisdictions in other, uh, in other parts of the world, pulling, putting the brakes on all of this and saying, hold on, we don't know what's going on here. Let's slow down. I think it makes it even more egregious that New South Wales is looking to go down this path. Mm. Let's just jump over to anti-discrimination uh, for a minute. And um, uh, I was alarmed at something you said in your presentation about the anti-discrimination board potentially in the future being able to initiate investigations without a complaint about something that had been said in a sermon, go looking, investigating. Tell me about that, Monica. Yeah, so amongst the proposals and uh, what we see in the Victorian legislation as well is the idea that the anti-discrimination board will be given uh, the power to, to conduct what they call own motion investigations. So they haven't received a complaint, but they would think, okay, well, we, we think there might be a systemic issue of conversion in some institution, we'll off our own motion go and start investigating that and they would have the power to compel witnesses to subpoena the production of documents and other things like that. Uh, and I would think if they're looking into systemic issues of conversion, then their first targets are going to have to be religious groups. Absolutely. Uh, and, and churches. And so I would expect empowered by this, um, particularly if they hire more staff in order to do that, they're going to be looking for something and you would have the potential of uh, a letter from the anti-discrimination board saying, we would like copies of your sermons that you've preached on this issue or anything like that. So we can judge for ourselves whether or not there is a systemic issue of conversion within your church. And look, I would dare I say, if there's a pastor who doesn't have a systemic issue of conversion going on in their preaching. Everybody is going to be preaching turn back to Jesus yes. in this area of your life or that area of your life. Um, you're a rebel, you need to repent. I'm a rebel, I need to repent. Absolutely. Yeah, if you're not calling to conversion, if you're not calling to repentance, you're probably not being faithful to, to the scriptures, to the at, scriptures all. at all. No, so no. yeah, so I think we've got a real systemic issue that mm. um, that's going to keep the anti-discrimination board busy. Mm. And this proposal was from Alex Greenwich's omnibus bill. I think it was also in the consultation paper. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, the Alex Greenwich omnibus bill, bill um, uh, that also included, um, uh, I think, when you come to gender change and somebody saying, I, I want to change gender, no need for any kind of surgical change. I just declare. And so you, you could end up on under that proposal with... Um, uh, me not being able to define who gets to search my body at the airport. Is that right? Or me being able to, being able to define who searches my body at the airport. Right. Uh, so I, st I define myself as a woman. Uh, and, so and then you I go through to... the thing. I'm saying I'm a woman today. I've done the paperwork. Uh, I go through. I go beep. Um, they say you need to have a strip search. And I say, well, I'm a woman. I want a woman officer to search me. Thank you and very much. And then an Islamic woman who's working on border security is put in a very difficult position. Absolutely. She's got, and she's, uh, at, at least under Alex Greenwich's um, proposals, she's got no grounds. She's got no grounds to say no because that would be discrimination for her to say, well, as a Muslim woman, I can't, I'm not going to touch a man's body. Um, uh, would be discriminatory because I'm a woman. I'm not a man. Mm. Uh, it's the same problem with single sex schools. It, it is legislate uh, even at the the safest legislation of saying this can happen at the age of 18 plus. 
there's heaps of 18 year old kids still doing the HSC. Mm. And so single sex schools have a massive problem. Uh, but then the legislation talks about what, you know, about the conditions that can happen at 16 plus mm. or even younger. And it doesn't even require necessarily a parent's support. You can get the court to agree with the child and there you go. They're now changed their gender. And even uh, at 18 residential colleges at university, I mean, we've all colleges, seen yes. mm. we've all seen the reports into what goes on at some of those residential colleges. Do you think anything's going to be better by um, mixing the sexes in those? I, and who's serious. going to be safer? Mm. And, and you can guarantee there's going to be a couple of guys who are going to try it on. Mm. Mm. That's just under the Greenwich one, or is that in, under the government one? That's under uh, Alex Greenwich's um, uh, omnibus proposal. Um, so sex self ID was not part. The, the, the government proposal we talk about is specifically conversion therapy, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a proposal from the Department of Communities and Justice. And I, I, I do emphasize that point because at the moment we haven't seen a proposal from the Labor Party of New South Wales. Right. We've only seen DCJ's proposal, which was requested by the government. And so there is still space for us to say, Labor have not even suggested they're going to be breaking our promises at that, this point. They've had a proposal put to them. We are calling on them to reject that proposal wholesale. And because if they accept the proposal, then they will absolutely have broken every one of their mm. promises. But so it, I think it's important to draw that distinction. But the sex self ID is um, one of uh, Alex Blanche's on the bus bill, which includes a conversion therapy legislation. And so you're hoping that that further. will be rejected outright? Oh, sorry. Monica. Yeah, look, absolutely. but. I think, as I understand it, the Labor government, if even if it doesn't support the sex self ID um, provisions of the Greenwich Bill, have going to do their indicated own. that they yeah. will do their own. That, that as a party position, that this is something that they are, that they support. So it's not That's the self sex ID thing. Self 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 of ID. some form. Yeah, of some, some form. form. Chris yeah. Mintz has said every other state has done it, which is a classic argument for jumping off the Harbour Bridge. But <laughs> uh, that, that is a statement that he's made and a commitment that he's made. And of the of Greenwich's omnibus bill, if you split it out. Out, you can split it out saying there's the conversion therapy section, okay? Let's put that over there because the government have committed to not use this conversion therapy legislation and are writing their own, and we mm -hmm. know that's going to happen. The second set is a whole lot of changes that's made to discrimination law. And it's, it's, a lot of them are, are, are very broad changes, which would make it almost impossible to, to make distinctions uh, between people, particularly for faith organisations. Uh, but the New South Wales government have initiated their own review into discrimination law and have committed that they will not um, implement any of these changes with the discrimination law until that review's happened. So we can, again, park that for a little bit, be very concerned, because we don't know what this review is going to come up with, but we can, but then the sex self ID is something that Alex Greenwich has written and the government has, in theory, committed to. It's actually quite a concerning piece of legislation. We don't know when that portion will come up. We, Alex's bill has not been split up, I believe. So, so it, the there is a separate conversion practices bill. Yes, and but the rest is the still rest all of it together. is still all together. So they they're not yet in the position to just pass sex self ID, but it will just need splitting the bill, and um, and then starting to debate it, and that's plausible to have happened within the November sitting. It is plausible. And there are other things in the Greenwich Bill um, that are also concerning. There are things like um, in relation to prostitution. So prostitution is already decriminalised here in New South Wales, but there are some limits on things like advertising, whether or not you can solicit outside churches or schools or things like that. Uh, and what the Greenwich Bill seeks to do is to remove even those very minor barriers um, so that there would be nothing to prevent somebody soliciting for sex work outside or even inside a church um, or outside a school or something like that. So to remove even those, those slight community taboos around prostitution. Uh, so that's something that, that's very strange and very, again, I think concerning out of the bill. You've been promoting a website Contact your MP. Contact your MP. Org. Au for people to contact their MPs That's, about it. Yeah, it's a fairly self-explanatory <laughs> name. Uh, so this is specifically at the moment the website is specifically about the conversion therapy legislation. It is a website to give you that will help you write 
call or meet with your MP. Uh, it's uh, not connected necessarily with any one faith or, um, or denomination, but it's for everybody to go. Uh, you can search for your MP, postcode search gives you talking points so you can uh, mm -hmm. write your letter. It gives you guides and lines about how to do it. You can find your MP's email address on there. If you wanted to go and have a meeting with your MP, it takes you step by step for the whole process, understanding what a meeting would be like. Here's the email to send to the MP asking for the meeting. Here's some talking points. Here's a two page document that you can walk through with your MP uh, with our concerns and our requests uh, laid out uh, and authorized and approved by 15 major faith organizations. This is a, the concern about conversion therapy is a multi-faith concern, as we already said. Um, Muslim communities, Hindu communities, Jewish communities are all really, really worried that they can't preach what they believe. So uh, this site's been designed to help every community to go and uh, speak up. The reason being that politicians don't know what we're concerned about until we tell them. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have great polling. And so the only way that they have an idea of what their electorate is, is they get a feel of the electorate by mm. the people who come and talk to them, by the letters they get. And we, particularly the Christian church, have, have really withdrawn from doing that. We're, we're mm. not keen to write letters. We're not keen. And so people think that we don't actually care about this issue. Mm. It's not hard to write a letter. And it makes a big difference, particularly when 100 odd personally written letters come through an MP's uh, office. They know mm. All right. Monica, Michael, thanks for coming in. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Monica Dermott is the uh, Director of Public Affairs and Engagement for the Catholic Church here in Sydney and uh, was one of the presenters at the Freedom for Faith Conference uh, here in Sydney today. And Mike Southen is Executive Director of Freedom for Faith. My name's Dominic Steele. You've been with us on The Pastor's Heart and we will look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon. Mm -hmm.